First of all, I want to congratulate all of you on your awesome ability at archery. Yeah. I'm really impressed. I haven't done this yet, and I've only shot a bow and arrow once in my life, and the person died, and <laughs> just a joke. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to getting into this. It's pretty exciting. Um, over the years, we've had, I mean, a great number of speakers come here and speak to us, and as you well know, oftentimes their material surpass their ability to express it to this audience, the body of the school. But some people say, why are we keep bringing them here? We keep bringing them here because Brandon has urged us from the beginning to gain knowledge. That knowledge was very important for us to have, to be able to understand aspects of all parts of our society and our culture, not only here, but from around the world. And with all the books that we get to review in RFC, there's one particular aspect of knowledge that I have um, felt compelled in my own right to research as long as I can remember, and that is the concept of God and religion. Now, one of, the, one of the problems that I have seen over the years, I know with my own self and certainly with some people that I know, is that religion has sort of laid down a legacy of guilt. And I know Ramtha has been teaching about what is the basis of your intent. And sometimes we look at our sense of failure and we wonder why it is that we have that. And I think, I think one could point correctly um, to perhaps our sense of failing God according to Western religion. We don't know why we feel this way, but certainly if any of you have had the privilege of uh, being raised in any sort of Orthodox or Southern Baptist um, American religious groups, the indoctrination is that we were born in sin and that we're sinners and that we have to work mightily hard to get back close to God and that there was only one person who was perfect and that was the Son of God and that he came here, died 2,000 years ago for our sins today at this event. And, well, you know, I, it's such an outrage because the very concept of God then is shattered through the small-mindedness and the power control of religions. And the greatest way that you can have power over your people is to separate them from God and give them an indoctrination of fear, an indoctrination of guilt, that you haven't been able to fulfill the religious right of living by God's word. Well, I feel this, that we all, to some degree, suffer from this legacy of guilt. And the only way that I think that we're really going to be able to dispel this is to be able to have individuals who, through their appointed destiny, have an urge to uncover information little strings being pulled out of, the, out of the void that start to open up knowledge, that start to expose what I consider a heresy. And one of those remarkable individuals is our speaker tonight, Mr. Christopher Knight. And he, he is coming to you from the stance of investigating the meaning, if you will, behind the initiatory rights of Freemasonry. What do, what do they mean and, and what is the purpose of Freemasonry and what is the mystery that they're trying to perpetuate? And I think you're going to find, even if you don't understand Freemasonry, I think you're going to find this very compelling material and perhaps if you're fortunate enough, you may start to be able to be relieved in a way of your guilt or your separation from God based on conditioning in your life. And this is the book, this was the first book that Christopher Knight co-authored with Robert Lomas. It's called The Haram Key. And if you haven't gotten this book and if you haven't read this book, 
I highly recommend that you do so. And after you do so, send however many you can afford to other people, they don't even have to be in the school that you know, and recommend that they read this book because this book has not hit the American market and you're going to understand tonight why it hasn't hit the American market. Second book that we're going to be getting hopefully before the Bokta is out, an incredible book called The Second Messiah. Um, I'm about halfway through this book and it's very hard to put it down. These, both of these books are very well written. They are an easy read even though the material is quite complicated. Um, this book along with Lawrence Gardner's work and the work of Holy Blood, Holy Grail, I consider um, outstanding books for the liberation um, of the lie to which we have suffered from and been perpetuated on us throughout generations. Now I want you to extend to me a favorable reception to a wonderful man who's just beginning to dig, Mr. Christopher Knight. Thank you, that's an incredible welcome. Uh, I hope I can live up to it. As you've heard, Robert Lomas and I have spent a considerable amount of time looking into the origins of Freemasonry and the rituals that are used by Freemasons. I am a Freemason, I've been a Freemason for 21 years. I joined because I was curious, I wanted to know what these people were doing. It seemed uh, like a strange organization that had some sort of knowledge that they kept to themselves and I thought I want to know what it is that they know and the only way to do that was to join and I thought if I don't like it I can leave again um, but I'm still a Freemason now just over eight years ago I set out with Robert Lomas to try and find out the origins of Freemasonry and we found that Freemasonry isn't something that is completely separate to the rest of the world, it's fully integrated with, with history. We thought maybe we'd get back to the 1500s to find some origins. We actually got back to the 1500s BC. Three and a half thousand years, and that was no, no way the beginning. It was the beginning of uh, the major rituals that are, are now used. Freemasonry is seen as a secret society. In this country, it's a little more open. Every town has a Masonic Lodge, but um, in England, my, my country, it tends to be uh, very secretive indeed. And people suspect it of all sorts of um, uh, evil deeds, of any murder that goes unexplained, it's probably due to Freemasons. <laughs> as far as I'm aware, that's not true. Now, I'm going to cover a lot of ground tonight because it was a personal investigation that Robert and I conducted. We had no intention of writing a book or telling anybody what we were doing when we set out some eight and a half years ago. It was purely a search for knowledge for, our, for ourselves because Robert, like myself, joined Freemasonry because we were curious. We saw lots of strange rituals and heard lots of strange words and then we said, hey, this is really interesting tell us what it's about. And we asked the, the elders and seniors in Freemasonry, what does this actually mean? And they just looked blank. They didn't know. <laughs> Very strange rituals that nobody understands. They couldn't have been invented because they're so bizarre. If you're going to invent something, you would have some sense, some logic to it. And the rituals of Freemasonry don't have a bundle of that. <laughs> now, we started with a blank sheet of paper. We weren't going to take anybody's um, ideas. Um, we were going to build, build up from a complete blank start. And it's my strong feeling that there's a, a problem in the world today in that because we're in this age of specialization, everyone sort of tunnels vertically downwards in a very linear fashion. So you have experts on some tiny subject. 
but it's really important to have a context, and that so often gets lost. So you, what, we re, what we've been in doing, really, is uh, trawling large amounts of information and bringing them together. And whilst we started out looking for the origins of Freemasonry, we've touched on a great deal more than that, the whole nature of religion, and Judaism and Christianity in particular. And it's going to be a complicated talk this evening, and I, I hope you'll stick with me. Now, when you first become a Freemason, um, you are stripped of your clothes. You have just a simple white gown put on. You are blindfolded. A noose is put around your neck, a running cord. You have uh, one leg exposed, one arm exposed, one breast exposed, a knife put to your breast. And as you're blindfolded with a knife at your naked breast, you feel very exposed. Um, and you are taken into the lodge room and paraded round north, east, south, and west to show yourself that you come properly prepared. You're divested of all metals, you have no money, and you are basically taken back to a very, very basic state. You are told that the pillars of King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem are of great importance the two pillars known as Boaz and Jarkin, as they're told in the Bible. You are told that your own personal morality can be compared to the building of King Solomon's temple, square and upright and perfect in every way. And you are told to act with charity to all people, not just fellow Freemasons, and to behave correctly and properly in a square and ordered fashion. And building concepts are used in a, as an analogy to the uprightness of, of moral rectitude. That's, that bit is reasonably, reasonably, reasonably easy to understand, but a lot of the actual ritual that surrounds that is, is very strange, and the, the words that are used are very odd, and would appear to be connected with um, ancient Egypt. A lot of the symbolism is obviously very old and very esoteric. Now, the the really interesting ritual is the third degree. The, no doubt must be some Freemasons here, or ex-Freemasons, I'm sure. But the third degree of Freemasonry makes the person a master mason. I say person because it's usually a man, but there is women's Freemasonry, which is very strong in this country. And as you enter the lodge room, it's different to the two previous occasions. It may be many months in between the, the three rituals that you'll go through, the three basic rituals. But it's very different because the room is in darkness except for one candle burning in the east in front of the two pillars of King Solomon's temple. And in between the two pillars sits the worshipful master. And you enter the room into this darkness and as your eyes adjust, uh, you can see the faces all around you. And you are told the story of Hiram Abiff Hence, the book is, my first book is called The Hiram Key. It was a search to find who Hiram was. You were told that Hiram of Biff was the builder of King Solomon's temple, and that shortly before its completion, he was murdered by three of his workmen who tried to extract from him the great secret that he possessed. But he would rather die than betray that secret that was entrusted to him, to people who were not yet worthy of it. And he was struck three blows at different parts, different gates of the temple, in the north, in the west, and then in the east, before he was struck down dead. And the candidate is made to go through that event, to reenact that killing. And as they are struck, the last blow on, on the center of the forehead, they are taken down straight to lie in their tomb. And then, by means of this ritual, which it turns out to be a very ancient ritual, they are resurrected, brought back to life again by means of a, a certain grip and certain words. And then certain words are whispered in their ears, which I'll come back to later on. And as they are rect resurrected back to the, a new life, the morning star shines in the east. And as they turn and look down at the grave they've been lifted from, they can see there is a skull, a human skull and crossbones, 
we've calculated that with the Masonic lodges around the world, there must be 50,000 human skulls in use by Freemasons today. <laughs> which sounds pretty bizarre, but most Freemasons wouldn't think about it. But uh, if you told them there were a cult of human skulls, they'd be surprised. But, <laughs> but that's what they are um, in many respects. So it's a quite traumatic experience being figuratively killed and then resurrected. And we were to find that that is an extremely ancient idea. Now the prayer that goes with this is quite interesting. We beseech thee to import thy grace to this thy servant who seeks to partake with us in the mysteries of the secrets of a master mason. Endue him with such fortitude that the hour of trial he fail not, but passing safely under thy protection of the dark valley of the shadow of death, he may finally rise from the tomb of transgression and shine as the stars forever and ever. So, as a newly made Master Mason, you have been resurrected. So, where could this, these ideas have come from? According to the United Grand Lodge of England, which is the, the parent body for Freemasonry in the world, it all started in 1717 in London. That is completely untrue, and there are records going back way before that, and they know it, um, but they keep insisting that that is the case. I'll come back onto that a little later. Now, we looked at the possible origins of Freemasonry. Um, there were three. It claims to have come from King Solomon's temple. So maybe it started with King Solomon, and it, what they are telling is a literal truth. But there's no way we can check that out, because the only real source of information on Solomon's temple is the Bible. And um, there's no way, therefore, we could uh, cross-check that. There is the popular idea that is put about by uh, official uh, Masonic historians that it developed from the stonemasons guilds of the Middle Ages. That is completely untrue. In England, there were no stonemasons guilds in the Middle Ages. There were in Europe, but, but not in Britain. And the idea that the original people who were speculative Freemasons, as they're called, the intellectual Freemasons, who were uh, the kings and princes of the realm should suddenly turn up at uh, uh, a trade union meeting of humble stonecutters and say, hey guys, teach us your secrets, uh, seems implausible. Um, and it's a long story to say that it has been fairly well discredited. Now, the other possible origin for Freemasonry, and one that has been never liked by uh, the official grand lodges, is that Freemasonry today is a development of the Knights Templar, the medieval order of, of monks who uh, were destroyed as heretics in 1307. Now, one of the reasons that they don't like discussing that is that the Knights Templar have been associated with all sorts of um, uh, strange claims over the years because they were clearly very, very odd people and they have therefore tended to be uh, associated with some, some crazy ideas. Um, but we are now able to absolutely prove that that is the origin of Freemasonry. There is a direct connection between the Order of the Knights Templar or the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, as they call themselves. I'll come back to that title because it has a, an importance which didn't, didn't really occur to us originally. So, in short, they were known as the Knights Templar. Now, I'll just tell you something of that order, um, and then I'll slowly weave the story back to how it all comes together. Shortly after the First Crusade in 1099, the people that were to become the Knights Templar formed themselves in Jerusalem in 1118, and in fact. They were nine French knights, just nine, middle-aged French knights that had come through the Crusades, um, and they camped on the ruins of Herod's temple in Jerusalem. Herod's temple had been destroyed in 70 AD by Titus and had been uh, a ruin ever since. The, in the seventh century, the Muslims had built the, the dome on the rock on top of it, um, but they camped on the part that had been uh, Herod's stables, and they spent nine years 
excavating. Now, history says that the Knights Templar were there to protect pilgrims uh, traveling on the roads, Christian pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem. There's no evidence whatsoever that they did do that, and it seems pretty unlikely that nine middle-aged French knights could have had a much impact against the Muslim hordes. <laughs> but they didn't do that anyway. They, they camped on Herod's temple, and um, they excavated, and they excavated night and day for those nine years. And we know that because in the last century, um, the Royal Engineers of the British Army um, conducted various excavations under the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the Warren and Wilson expeditions, and they found the, the cuttings created uh, by uh, the Templars. And in there they found nothing but odd items left by the Knights Templar, broken swords, a spur, Templar cross, various artifacts which are now in the keeping of the Knights Templar um, archivist in Scotland. The other people had uh, indeed um, identified that the Templars had dug there. The French historian uh, Guétien de la Forge said, the real task of the nine knights was to carry out research in the area in, in order to obtain certain relics and manuscripts which contained the essence of the secret traditions of, Ju of Judaism and ancient Egypt, some which probably went back to the days of Moses. That we found is absolutely correct. Now, the Templars lived in poverty in for those nine years um, under the um, help and rule of the king, the Christian king of Jerusalem, Baldwin II. But by 1128, they suddenly became miraculously wealthy, wealthy beyond all imagination, and influential, powerful. They had their own rule given to them by the Pope, uh, making them a holy order. They were both warriors and monks. And all that after spending nine years digging around in Jerusalem. What on earth had they found? What had they been looking for? Now, they were given a, a Latin rule, that is their own constitution, if you like, by the Pope. But about 10 years after that, they converted that into a, a French rule, and they made little changes, which went barely noticed. The first rule said that the Templars must congregate wherever um, knights uh, were to be found. They changed that to they should gather wherever excommunicated knights should be found. <laughs> a, su a subtle difference. <laughs> there were lots of connections we could see with Freemasonry uh, from the start. They wore um, a small sheepskin bodies, a sort of leather underpants, which they never removed. Um, which must have been really nice in the, in the, in the desert sun. <laughs> they were celibate, understandably. <laughs> Freemasons today have their, um, their, their leather aprons on the front, which is a little bit more hygienic, I think. <laughs> the Templars were interested in the, the, the passage from darkness to light, and their, their flag, the Beausant, was a a flag made of a black section and a white section, and that's repeated throughout Freemasonry today. The carpets are black and white squares. Um, the Freemason wears a, a black suit, a black tie, a white shirt, black and white only, um, which has got direct connection. So it was very clear, very quickly, that the, these Knights Templar um, had camped on Jerusalem, on the temple in Jerusalem, Herod's temple, and they'd excavated that ruin looking for something. What had they found? That was the question. Well, within a very few years, the rumors were spreading around the Western world that they were conducting some strange rituals, that they were perhaps heretics. Um, from 1118, they lasted until 1307. On Friday the 13th of October, 1307, they were destroyed as heretics. Friday the 13th has never been considered a good day ever since. And that is the reason why. 
Now, could they have been approached by some Muslim who were actually changed their views? That seems pretty unlikely. It would be a brave deed for some Muslim to come up to a bunch of Christian knights uh, who were not famed for their gentleness. Um, the crusade uh, had been particularly wicked and everyone in Jerusalem, whether they were Muslim, Jewish or, or whatever, were, were put to the sword when the Christians arrived. Um, so that seemed pretty unlikely. We really believe that they had found some documentary um, material beneath Herod's temple. Whether they were looking for the Ark of the Covenant, for Solomon's treasures, uh, we didn't know. Um, but we could speculate that whatever they were looking for, that they must have found something rather more interesting. Now, the first thought for, to us was, of course, that they may have found some Gnostic uh, material, the Gnostic Gospels, such as being uh, discovered at Nag Hammadi in Egypt. And we started to, to look at the nature of um, Christianity and early Christianity, how it was formed, because we didn't know much more than the, the, the average person, really. Um, and we spent quite a long time trying to absorb the whole situation. And there was this great battle between gnosis and faith, it seems. Um, the idea of gnosis, knowledge, um, being the pathway. Uh, it was quite at odds with the, the absolute requirement for, shall I say, blind faith that the church uh, brought in. That is, faith because we tell you so, not because it's a, a reasoned faith. So there, was, there appeared to be this very early battle between gnosis or knowledge and, and faith because you are told it is so. Now, the Gospel of Philip, for instance, a so-called Gnostic Gospel, um, because there was quite an arbitrary split between what was Gnostic and what was not. Um, Matthew, Mark and Luke had no problem, but the Gospel of John, which made it into the New Testament, nearly didn't because it was considered to be very Gnostic. Um, but others, like the Gospel of Philip, were excluded. Um, but in the Gospel of Philip, it says, Those who say they will die first and then rise are in error. They must receive the resurrection whilst they live. So the idea of a living resurrection was, was quite important, just as it is in Freemasonry today. Um, and there was a, obviously a great battle um, in the second, third century between these two forms of Christianity that had come out of uh, Jerusalem. Now the Celtic church that, that operated in uh, Northern England and Scotland and Ireland until 664 AD was very different to the Roman church. It was based on um, more Alexandrian um, Christianity until 664 AD when they surrendered to the Roman church, they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was a God. They believed he was a great prophet. There were quite a number of differences which had to be removed uh, by, by Rome. They battled or they debated and uh, arranged deals. It took 50 years for the surrender to happen, but they actually gave in in the Synod of Whitby in 664. Now, the Christian church, such as it stands today, was created on the 20th of May, 325 AD, by a man who wasn't even a Christian. The Emperor Constantine took a, had a vote taken. Uh, was Jesus a God, was he not? It, it, there were debates this way and that. Um, Arius, who said uh, that he clearly wasn't, lost the day, and immediately he was called a heretic. Um, so, because a heresy is anything that uh, you believe that I don't tell you to believe. If I, am the, if I am the church, which I'm not. Now, the story that was created uh, was quite different to anything that could conceivably be in Jewish. The Jewish church of Jerusalem um, could not have believed the things that were decided by these uh, fourth century uh, Romans. But it's interesting when you look at this, this idea of um, this resurrected um, God figure who was born of a virgin. Um, there are a whole host of people before uh, Jesus who, who did pretty much the same things. Uh, Gautama Buddha, of course, was born of a, a virgin, virgin mayor, around 600 BC. Uh, Quirinus, early Roman saviour, born of a virgin. Attis, born of a virgin. Uh, Indra, born of a virgin, 700 BC. 
Adonis, Krishna, Zastra, and of course Mithra, uh, born of a virgin in a stable on the 25th of December, 600 years before Jesus, and he was resurrected, his resurrection was celebrated at Easter. So it wasn't a very original story. Uh, there was... <laughs> it should have been done for plagiarism, really. <laughs> but this was quite alarming for us to find out. I mean, it was quite easy to find out. It's just that the, the scholars, Christian scholars, uh, biblical scholars and theologians don't tend to talk about this to ordinary people. They know about it, but they keep it fairly quiet. Um, the early church scholars tried to reconcile this, and they said, ah, oh, it's that dog Satan is at it again. He's actually used a time machine to go backwards to take the mickey out of Jesus. <laughs> well, that's one way of explaining it, I suppose. But. So an important thing as well is the name Jesus Christ. Um, a lot of casual Christians are brought up, um, obviously from childhood, to, to understand Christianity. They, they see it as a name. Hi, Jesus, you know, um, Mr. Christ. Um, <laughs> but it, it's not a name, it, it's a description. Um, and one that's been heavily changed um, and lost all sense of its original meaning uh, in terms of Hebrew. Uh, Jesus is a Greek translation of uh, Yehoshua, um, the, the Greek name, word meaning saviour. Um, so it was a description as well as a name. The, 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 uh, like most Arabic words today, there are very few, if any, abstract uh, words. They all have literal meanings. So it could be attached to a person because that's what they were or because it was just a, a name. But uh, Christ or Christus is a Greek version of the idea of the Messiah now, a Messiah, originally in Hebrew, meant uh, smeared with oil um, because it was a very holy uh, thing to do. And it certainly never was intended to be a one-off, a Messiah. Uh, there could be many, but as I'll go on to, to explain, there was a, a search for two Messiahs, uh, not one, at the time of, of Jesus. They were looking for a, a priestly Messiah and a kingly Messiah. Now, as we were looking at this whole period and realizing that things weren't quite as we'd been taught as children, um, we obviously started to look um, along at, with Gnostic Gospels at the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the Judean Desert in, in Qumran in 1947, which have given a lot of uh, information on how to understand other documents and even uh, reinterpret the New Testament. They were kept under wraps, and only just recently have all of the documents been made available to, to, to scholars. But we looked at the Essene community, the so-called Essene community, that had created them, the people of Qumran, and their teacher of righteousness they repeatedly speak about in the documents. It appears there were two teachers of righteousness, one early uh, in the period, um, 300 BC maybe, and one at the end, uh, of their period, um, which is the time of Jesus and his brother James. They talk of themselves as being the elect, um, having a new covenant with God, um, and they use many terms which uh, we can recognize in, in the New Testament. They wore white robes, uh, they took vows of poverty, they were said to have a secret knowledge, and they had terrible penalties for those that betrayed that, that secret knowledge. And many people have now uh, shown that the last teacher of righteousness was James the Just, James the brother of Jesus. And uh, that has became very evident to us working on the subject as well. Now, Jesus is said to be Jesus of Nazareth. Um, I think some of you will have already heard that there was no such place as Nazareth in, in those days. It just did not exist. And if, it, if it had have existed, it would have been clear in Roman documentation. It's just not there. Um, so Jesus was a, a Nazarene or a Nazarite, um, perhaps. Certainly John the Baptist was a, a, a Nazarite, a, a, an ascetic, long-haired, living a hard, tough life. Um, but 
there's another word, I think, which is quite important that we came across. I came across whilst in, in Egypt, um, Nazarani. Um, I enjoy scuba diving, and I was diving in the, in the Red Sea, and I had a particularly good dive when they saw this giant manta ray. And I asked the Egyptian guide what the dive site was called, and he said, uh, uh, Raz Nazrani. And I said, what does Nazrani mean? He said, in Arabic, and he said, oh, it's like fishes, lots of fishes. I said, what sort of fishes? He said, just common, ordinary fishes, but when there's thousands and thousands of them. The very next day on Mount Sinai, I heard someone referring to Christians as Nazrani. I thought, that's interesting. Checking it out, they're the same word used today by a Christian is Nazrani. And it made sense that they could be called the lots of little fishes, because of course the original symbol of the early church was the symbol of the fish. Possibly a sort of slang term, because it wasn't, it wasn't adopted uh, until after the uh, fall of the temple, but uh, possibly because they were always baptizing each other, were always in water, uh, and because there were just so many of them. <laughs> <clears throat> One interesting find that we came across was concerning the, the Mandians. Uh, now, the, the Mandians are a group that are largely found in, in southern Iraq. Um, now, they, they live in a, a way uh, which is ident identical to the original Jerusalem church. Now, their own history claims that they left Jerusalem at the time of, of Saul's arrival and, he, and his purges against the Jews, the Jewish Christians as we would identify them, the Jewish church. And they fled uh, south, and they have remained in an identical fashion. They can, their baptisms that they can uh, conduct now are identical to the way that the baptism of John the Baptist would have looked like as he baptized Jesus, for instance, in their clothing, their ceremonies. But they've also, by um, uh, observers, been described as very like masonry, Freemasons because they have secret handshakes, they have uh, rituals and initiations which are very, very similar. So of course that created a lot of interest for us. And they tell the story that John the Baptist was the founder of the movement that Jesus was later to lead. And that Jesus was accused of being a traitor because he betrayed secrets that, to ordinary people that he wasn't entitled to betray. And they still maintain John the Baptist is the, the true leader of their, their, their faith. Now they also uh, worship um, or, or identify with a star, a star in the west they call America, which is over the great ocean to the west, which hovers above a land where everything is pure and wonderful. And they call that star, which is in fact <coughs> Venus in its evening setting, they call it Merica, which struck us as rather interesting. And I'll come on to that later because um, uh, that gelled into a, a rather interesting explanation. But as we looked at this whole period and took stock of what we were looking at, we weren't getting in really anywhere into finding what um, had been buried beneath the temple, if anything had been. But what we had found out is that most of the ideas that we had about Christianity, about the founding of the original church, were wrong. And there was a lot more work to do. In fact, Pope Leo X in the 1500s uh, came clean when he said, it has served us well, this myth of Jesus Christ. <laughs> the one thing's for sure, the Roman Empire by 325 uh, was in decline. They couldn't maintain it by force of arms. They could maintain it by taking people's minds and religion. So at that point, we were uh, a bit stumped. What, what could they have found? And we thought the only way to find out is to go right back in time and reconstruct the mindset of the people that were, that were around at the time. Because if anything was buried in Herod's temple, it had to be buried around the time of Jesus and his brother James, because there was a tiny window of opportunity Herod's temple was being built um, whilst uh, Jesus was alive, and it wasn't even finished when his brother James died in 62 AD. 
It was only just finished when it was destroyed in 70 AD. So you can bury scrolls beneath a half-finished temple. So perhaps there was about a 30-year window, something like that. But it was certainly, uh, anything that was buried there was buried there at the time of Jesus and James. We were still doing private research here, yeah, remember? So anyone that was doing a, a more serious study wouldn't have done what we did, and just take a, a leap backwards. But we went back to the land of summer. That's the earliest point that you can get uh, in history, or so we thought at the time, because that's when writing was invented, sort of 6,000 years ago, between uh, the, the land called Summer, which is between the uh, Tigris and Euphrates, which of course is um, largely now Iraq. And um, although it was once the Garden of Eden, if you like, the cradle of civilization, um, it's sad to say that it was the area that was, uh, had to be carpet bombed during the, the war with Saddam Hussein. And unfortunately as well, the, the Mandians that are there may or may not still be alive because Saddam Hussein is con conducting genocide against them. So this living fossil of the Jerusalem church um, may be lost or at least heavily uh, damaged. So we looked at this civilization of Summer. They were great people. They, they invented writing, or so we believe. They invented the wheel. They invented glass, they invented metalworking. They were very, very skilled at, at many crafts. Um, and they, they left behind very detailed records on their, um, their, their tablets of clay. Their theology is interesting. It seemed that the really important um, unit of theology to them was the, the pillar a freestanding pillar, not part of a building, which was a sort of artificial mountain, which was an umbilical to connect heaven with earth. And we could see a radiation, radiating effect of this, this belief uh, traveling into different places, to Turkey, to, to Egypt. And we next looked at the Egyptian civilization to see how that connected and what they had taken from the land of summer, remembering that Abraham came from Summer rather later. He came from the city of Ur, one of the principal cities, and uh, went up to Egypt uh, with his wife. And it was also interesting that Abraham talks of the, the God of our fathers. Now, the origin of that is that each individual uh, Sumerian had originally their own personal God sort of inside them that they related to. But as they had children, their children would often adopt their father's god. And so it would go on generation after generation. So you'd have a little clan that all had their, their sort of family god. And that what they would call the god of their fathers. Uh, so there were lots of gods, but Abraham's was, was his own. And as he went uh, north towards Egypt, um, that is what he was referring to, his, his personal family god. So we looked at Egypt. Um, to see if we could get any sort of clues there, because that's heavily uh, interrelated with, with summer at one end and with the, the nation of the Jews at the, at the other. And it was immediately very interesting, because 3,200 BC, Egypt suddenly sprung almost from nowhere um, into existence. It was the union of two countries, we're told, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. Upper Egypt in the south, because it was in the mountains where the Nile flowed from, and Lower Egypt in the north on the Mediterranean coast. Now, each of those two countries had their pillar, their, their single pillar that connected them uh, with, their, with God. And when they united the two countries together, they had a problem, this new united Egypt, uh, in which one was going to lose the pillar, because they really only needed one. Um, and they solved it by keeping them both. Um, now, in lower, uh, in lower Egypt, which was the, the older of the, the two uh, countries, they, the principal city, which is um, now in a uh, suburb of Cairo, um, is known in the Bible as the city of On, the priestly city of On, or Heliopolis, as the, Greek, as the Greeks called it. But it was originally called Anu. And that's interesting because it has a meaning, of course, and Anu means pillar, it's simply pillar. Now, its counterpart city uh, in Upper Egypt was Southern Pillar. So it was very clear the great importance of pillars uh, to them. Now, 
we believe that they kept both those pillars because they, they saw them as like lintels holding up the sky, the sky god nut. Because those two lands in Egypt are north and south, those pillars faced east towards the rising sun and towards the rising morning star as well. Now, in Freemasonry, we're told that the one pillar stands for uh, strength and the other pillar stands for um, founding, the founding pillar, the original one, and one united stability. Now, that's how the two pillars of Solomon's temple are described, but that is exactly what the ancient Egyptians got. They believed that when those two pillars, when those two lands were put together, they would have stability. And if they were ever parted, they would lose that stability, and that is exactly what happened, as I'll come on to shortly. So there was a sort of connection um, speculative at this stage, certainly, <clears throat> between ancient Egypt um, and its interesting pillars and the, the pillars of Freemasonry. <clears throat> it was certainly enough to make us to look um, rather deeper and further at ancient Egypt. We found that they had a, had a remarkable principle, um, something called Ma'at, which was, had been in uh, Egypt from the very beginning, from um, 5,200 years ago, and ma'at was an idea of doing good for good's sake. It was, it was morality outside of religion, which is very rare. And they likened ma'at to being square and upright like the foundations of a temple. The whole description was identical to Freemasonry. You could not divide the, the, the definition of either. Ma'at and Freemasonry were totally synonymous. And that's, as far as we are aware, completely unique because most moral codes come out of religious belief or some religious framework. Uh, whereas uh, the idea in Freemasonry and the idea in Ma'at is doing good for good's sake. And Egyptian kings would be uh, eventually measured um, on their ability to do, to do Ma'at. Um, and eventually Ma'at was turned into a goddess um, but for a long, long time, uh, it stood alone as an abstract concept. <clears throat> so here we had something that which was quite a remarkable connection, and we were increasingly convinced that there was something here. Because in Freemasonry today, the imagery is, 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 is ancient Egyptian, and the, uh, the claim of antiquity that is in the rituals is that it comes from ancient Egypt. It's just that no one believes it. So it looked as though the claim was genuine. We looked at the king-making rituals of ancient Egypt, or what is known about them, and there's a great deal known. The king is, when, he, uh, when he's made a king, is given a collar and an apron, just as a mason is. Um, he's conducted around the country, which is symbolically inside the temple, exactly as it happens in the Masonic temple, around the four uh, points of the compass. But no one knew exactly, and it has often been a mystery, of what it was that actually made somebody the king of ancient Egypt. Because when the old king died, there was a period of, of instability when someone else could usurp the throne because they could only, only hold the rituals on certain dates. But once someone was made the king of Egypt, that was it. No one would ever challenge them. So something very special happened, and that's never been un understood. We think we found the explanation for it. Now, <clears throat> I will mention here the, the actual story of the founding of Egypt, which is the little legend of Osiris um, and his killing. Uh, Osiris was uh, attacked by his brother Set, who wanted his power, and he was cut into pieces and his, his body put into the Nile. And Isis, their sister, um, gathered together uh, those parts of uh, Osiris and breathed life into his body uh, long enough um, to, 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 to mount him and impregnate herself because the brothers and sisters, of course, were um, um, required to, to marry to keep the bloodline pure. So uh, she became uh, pregnant from this briefly uh, resurrected uh, God who then departed um, to rule uh, in the land of the dead and shine as the stars, as it says in Freemasonry, forever and ever. And the offspring that was born is known as the Horus. 
And Horus, when he grew to manhood as a young man, uh, did battle <coughs> with his uncle Set. And in that terrible battle, um, the Horus lost an eye, and Set lost his testicles. Very inconvenient. But this was a battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And it was said to be a non-decisive battle, and therefore that battle would continue at all times. And at night, um, the forces of darkness would magnify, and during the day, the forces of, of goodness would magnify. <coughs> now, the Horus was the name of the king of Egypt. He was a god. His father was Osiris, and he was Horus. And when he died, he became the new Osiris, and his son became the new Horus. And therefore, he was the son of God, as all kings were later to be described as the son of God, um, which is not unique to, uh, to the man we call Jesus Christ. And also an important description in Freemasonry is the son of the widow. Now, the Horus was very much the son of the widow because his mother was widowed even before he was conceived, which is a, an unusual <laughs> arrangement. I believe it can be achieved these days, but... Um, but then it must have been unique. Um, so, though again, there were connections with uh, Freemasonry and, of course, the connections with all religions thereafter, that the Son of God, uh, the King, was in some way the Son of God. Now, we looked at the actual resurrection ceremony, which we believe at the one point was con uh, conducted inside the, the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau, and that it was a resurrection ceremony that when the king died, he became Osiris, and he was embalmed, mummified, and he was duly taken to the land of the dead. But we believe, uh, and we've had a lot of support from this from um, people that know a great deal about ancient Egypt, that the Horus traveled with him, that he went to a temporary death, that his son lay side by side on the night of the ritual, and with the use of drugs, no doubt, went into a cat catatonic state uh, and was believed to have departed um, so that his father could show him the route to um, the heavens, the stars, to meet the past gods of Egypt um, and there to be made a god. Because you can crown a king, but who can make a god? Only other gods can create a god. So we believe that they thought that the new Horus traveled um, to the land of the dead there to be created a god himself. And when he returned in the morning with the light of the morning star, the alignment of the shaft in the pyramid is such that the light of the morning star, as it breaks over the Sinai, comes straight down that shaft into the body of the Horus. Now that explains a lot. That would explain why after that ceremony no one would argue with him because uh, he was believed to be an absolutely a god who had been created uh, a god in the heavens. Now, we speculated when we, we wrote the book that uh, the drugs would have been used, um, and very recently it's been found uh, that mummies of that early period uh, have got very strong traces of cocaine and nicotine uh, inside in the bodies. And which is very strange for a number of reasons, um, most particularly that those are South American crops. They couldn't come from anywhere else. So without a shadow of a doubt, there was trade between South America and ancient Egypt, which of course has the, um, the, the scholars um, um, looking very puzzled. The, the way they deal with it is just to say, oh, I won't look at that. Um, <laughs> This, this, verti this vertical channeling. See, ancient, the Egyptologists really sp sprung out of, um, of the European, mostly, uh, uh, people that ventured off uh, in the, the last century to Egypt and uh, looked at everything, dug everything up, and if they couldn't understand it, it was a tomb, because these were primitive people. We're the smart ones. We're the, the pinnacle of all God's creation. The idea that someone before may have known more than them would never cross their minds. And they, they look at ancient Egypt as though it was just stood alone, but of course it doesn't. It was connected 
with everything else. Um, but they, they don't have this holistic approach, which is what we've tried to have in our work, and a lot of people uh, are now trying to, to do. Now, it's interesting that the Morning Star, which is so important in Freemasonry and so important to the ancient Egyptians, um, was designated by a hieroglyph with a little flag and a five-pointed star, which had the literal meaning, sacred knowledge, which is what the Horus, of course, achieved um, on his journey. <clears throat> we were really convinced at this point that we were onto something, that, that the bits were gluing together too, too well, that uh, there was something in it. <clears throat> and so we looked for, for other glitches, and we, we focused on the Hyksos period, as it's called, the second um, period when there had been problems in ancient Egypt. Now, this occurred, they, they dated at 1782 to 1570 BC, and the Hyksos were Asiatics that uh, came into Egypt and occupied the country, and into Lower Egypt initially. And this is where they divided the, the two halves of the country again, and the stability was gone. They invaded, it wasn't a, a one-off invasion when they marched in, it was a slow sort of infiltration because the country had gone into a low ebb, it had gone into social decline, crime had gone up, um, things just weren't working too well, and so these foreigners waltzed in. There were some battles, they did sack the odd city that stood against them, but by and large it was just a, a relatively peaceful uh, grabbing of, of ancient Egypt. Because the Egyptians were lovely people, they really were not warlike, they were pretty useless at war probably still are in actual fact, but um, <laughs> they um, are, were so friendly. They would allow people um, to come and share in their crops, that, to, to have their water in times of drought. Um, they, they, were, um, they were good. And we looked for any sort of glitches or oddities, and we found one particularly strong oddity. And that was right at the very end of this so-called Hyksos period of occupation, with a a king of ancient Egypt called, called Seka Henry Tao, who was the true king of uh, Egypt, but he had been forced south to the, the city now we know they, they call Thebes. And he was uh, forced to pay taxes and dues to his Asiatic masters, uh, King Apophis at the time. And um, he had his rituals and his secrets, but not much else. He lived in near poverty uh, in Thebes at that time. But we believe the point came of, um, of, of real resistance because Apophis, who took the name uh, of this serpent of darkness that was feared by all Egyptians, which was a deliberate act to really upset the whole Egyptian people, because uh, these Asiatics wore beards and they were quite frightening looking, whereas Egyptians were all always clean shaven. Um, but Apophis was growing old, and he didn't want to die an Asiatic death and rot in the ground. He thought, look, I'm the proper king of Egypt. They paid their taxes to me. Why shouldn't I have the secret of this everlasting life? Uh, and I can go and shine as a star forever and ever. And so he said to Seka Henry Tao, tell me this secret that you've got. And we believe that the young king, he was about 30, that's young to me anyway, um, said, no way. I'll pay your taxes and you can have everything, but you're not having this birthright, this secret. And uh, so Apophis sent out a group to extract that secret from Seca Henry in Thebes. And they knew his movements because he would go to the temple at noon every day, as described in Freemasonry, I have to say. And the re reason he went there is because at noon the sun is high above the, your heads. We stand on the desert sand, you cast virtually no shadow at all. So the stain of darkness, the power of evil, is at its absolute minimum. The power of goodness is at, at, its, at its peak. Because every Egyptian went to bed at night wondering and worrying whether the morning would come, because they thought one night the battle with Apophis may be lost, and therefore night would uh, be there forever and day would not come. That was their principal fear. So, as Hiram Abiff in Masonic legend went into the temple at noon, as was his uh, normal procedure, so did Seca Henry. And he was attacked. Um, we believe that at least two of his uh, priests would have also been attacked to extract the secrets. And he was struck several blows to his head and killed. And his mummy still 
survives. It's in the Carrier Museum. And the blows to Seca Henry's head are identical to the blows described in Masonic legend. Now, that's interesting, but it's even more interesting when you, we note that he's the only king of Egypt known to have died a violent death. It's been speculated that he was uh, killed in battle. The problem with that is there were no battles. <laughs> Records are pretty good, and there were no battles. Um, so that's not true. Um, more recently, um, a colleague that um, I've made a result, as a result of working on this book, a, a fellow from Cambridge University who studied battlefield ba um, injuries said there is no doubt those are not battlefield injuries, they are the marks of an assassin assassination. <clears throat> so he was killed and the secrets were lost forever because it was passed down uh, the, the line. So we believe that um, there was a major problem for his sons, Amosis and Carmosis, and that they couldn't get their true secrets passed on to them. Certainly Apophis didn't get them, and Carmosis and Amosis immediately went to battle when their father was killed, and they did uh, take the battle to the Egyptians and they threw them uh, to the um, Hyksos, and they threw them out of Egypt. Uh, they were chased back to Jerusalem, interestingly enough. Now, what could they do? They had to create new secrets. Now, we're told in Freemasonry, the, as we reenact this death of Hiram Abiff, that the true secrets of a master mason were lost. And we have substituted secrets that we'll have to do until time will maybe return the true secrets. That is what happened, we believe, in ancient Egypt, that they had to recreate certain elements of that secret of uh, uh, eternal life. And the really interesting thing we found is that the words whispered into the ear that I mentioned as the, the new master mason is raised from the ground, gibberish is whispered into their ear. Mat neb mana mat ba'a. It doesn't make any sense to anybody. Because we're in this mode of looking at ancient Egypt, and I was starting to get a little bit familiar with um, uh, Egyptian words, it sounded a sort of ancient Egyptian to me, and so I checked it out, it was pure ancient Egyptian. It means, great is the master of Freemasonry, great is the spirit of Freemasonry. So the chances of it making sense in Egyptian were pretty damn slim. For it to actually mean that is beyond all um, comprehension or coincidence. I'm taking Ma'at, to mean Freemasonry there because they have identical definitions, otherwise the, the words are, are absolutely uh, correct. So uh, great is the master of Freemasonry, great is the spirit of Freemasonry, which was a sort of uh, waving a finger in the air to Apophis really saying, you've had a go at us, you've failed, we're still, we're still there, we're still winning. So, okay, if we're right, the resurrection ritual used by Freemasonry that came to us via the Knights Templar and via the Jerusalem Church came from ancient Egypt. So how did it get from ancient Egypt into use in Jerusalem in the first century AD? Well, the obvious connection there is uh, a chap called Moses, who we are told in the Bible was a member of the Egyptian royal family. He was a general in the Egyptian army, served very well. Um, but committed a murder and had to run and eventually uh, released the Israelites or the Habaru as the Egyptians called them, the Hebaru as they were later known and took them uh, to their, their promised land. <clears throat> now he would have been um, versed in the secret knowledge of the resurrection ceremony. He may have undergone it himself, because we think that they, they opened it out. They didn't want to ever again keep it limited to one person, because it was too dangerous. They had to have a broader base. And so he would have known and understood this ritual. And when he wanted to create this new kingdom, what else would he do but adopt um, the, the magic, if you like, um, religion and magic, magic were wholly connected in those days, and it isn't it is said that he was a magician, um, which means that he, he understood the secrets of the um, Egyptians. Again, it says in the Old Testament he understood all the secrets of the Egyptians. 
So Moses took his band, um, of, it said 600,000 people from Egypt across the Red Sea. Couldn't possibly have been anything like that number because Egyptian records don't show it. That would have had a dramatic effect on the workforce, on food supplies, all sorts of things. That was a huge number of people. So it couldn't have been that number. But assuming that he left with those people and they, they formed the new nation, and assuming that the descriptions given in the Old Testament are true, they butchered their way from city to city, uh, slaughtering everyone they could find until uh, eventually the people got to Jerusalem. Of course, Moses was uh, long dead by that time. But there is evidence that the, the encampments and the towns that they uh, established en route, the first thing they did was put down two pillar bases and put up two pillars. They are still uh, there and to be found. So eventually the first king of this new nation, if you want to call it, of the Jews, we're told, was Saul. Um, then King David, the famous King David, and his son Solomon. Now, in this journey that Moses had undertaken uh, with Joshua and others, they'd come across this, this storm god, this war god of the Sinai that, they, that we know as Yahweh or Jehovah. Uh, it was a name that wouldn't be pronounced. Moses tried to trick the name out of this god because he knew that um, a magician could have power over a god. If you could get them to give them the name, a man could control them. But this god wasn't silly, so he refused to give his name. He said, mind your own business. Um, I am who I am. And um, we're told that the, the Jews adopted this god as their, their favorite god, and he has developed into god, the one god that we uh, recognize today. Um, but really, all gods are just a merging of, of the one, in my view, um, and that is just one route back. But David wanted to, after they took Jerusalem from the Jebusites, David wanted to build a temple to this, this god, I'll call him Yahweh, um, but he never did succeed in doing that. Now, the interesting thing is that Jerusalem is cited in the connection between the two lands that, of which David was king, of Israel and Judah, north and south orientated, exactly like ancient Egypt. It was a carbon copy. They had the two lands, and they had to have the two pillars facing east. Um, and that is why he wanted to build a temple with the two pillars of Boaz and Jarkin facing east, so they could conduct these, these rituals inside the temple of, of king-making. Now, David didn't succeed in doing it, but his son Solomon did, we are told. I say that because there is no archaeological evidence whatsoever of Solomon's temple. Um, there is of later temples. So it may be mythical, it may be real, it doesn't really matter because it's what the Jews believed uh, that is important. On balance of probabilities, it probably is true, I think. So the temple was built by Herod, but it was one third of the size of his harem. Uh, so we can see where his uh, priorities lay. Um, it, it, was not, it was not a huge building at all, and he, he was a great builder. Now, the problem is that Solomon was too much of a great builder. He taxed his people dreadfully. He brought in foreign uh, people to build all over the place. And when he died, he ended up uh, denying Yahweh. He got fed up with him and went back to other gods. And um, he left the country almost godless and bankrupt, which wasn't a flying start for the, for the new nation of the Jews. His son was pretty useless and made the situation a whole lot worse, and eventually the two lands went to war with each other, um, and things didn't go well at all. But they had their king-making ritual, and they had their knowledge of ancient Egypt, and they had the story of the death of Seca Henry Tao as a beacon um, in their, their, their legends that they passed on. Now, in 597, Nebuchadnezzar arrived and took Jerusalem, and of course the Babylonian captivity started when the, the elders and uh, in, in, intellectuals of Jerusalem were removed and taken into captivity. Um, and it's here that the Old Testament was written down. I believe until um, this point in the 6th century BC, it was an or oral tradition entirely, um, and it got woven into um, Babylonian ideas um, which, where we can see the, the connection in the, the Old Testament between the Epic of Gilgamesh and the, the uh, stories of uh, 
of the Old Testament. And Ezekiel was very, very important. It tells us in the Old Testament how he brought the elders of Jerusalem together and he berated them for their Egyptian ways. He said, it's no wonder Yahweh isn't supporting us. Um, you're not worthy. You're, you're really still stuck with all the old Egyptian gods. And he, he tells these visions of going back to Jerusalem, flying through the air and peeking into the temple and seeing all of the Egyptian writings around the wall. And he tells them, you've got to clean up your act and become more Jewish. And so we believe they recited the greatest story um, in their, their culture, that the, the story of Second Henry Tao. They recited it to the most important event that they knew of, which was the, the building of King Solomon's temple. And they, called, uh, they identified that person as Hiram. Now, um, other people before us have said the definition of Hiram Abif is, Hiram is Hebrew uh, for, for king, and Abif is said to be Old French for the one that is lost. So the king that was lost would be a very good description of Seca Henry Tao. It's interesting, by the way, that there weren't any more kings of Egypt after that. When, after, when he died, he was, he was really the last king. There were only pharaohs, and a pharaoh was a much lesser being. The power, it was the power of the family, the pharaoh. It was like the power of the White House instead of the power of the president, if you like. Um, so there, there, was a, there was a power loss at that point. So Ezekiel told these people that they had to get holier. They had to, be, to inter interface with their God much more strongly. They had to uh, be holier. They had to get all the old ideas washed away. When they were released um, from that captivity, they returned to Jerusalem and uh, led by uh, Zerubbabel, which is a, um, a Babylonian name, of course. Um, and he built a new temple in Jerusalem, which there is archaeological evidence and this was a, a more splendid temple than the original one. But that too eventually uh, was destroyed and Herod's temple was built on, a, on the same site. So there were three temples, or perhaps four, because Ezekiel had a vision, re, visionary temple that he wanted to build, which became inspirational uh, to uh, later Jewish people and to the Knights Templar. So these intellectual people that returned to Jerusalem by the third century BC had spun off a group that we know as the, the Qumran community, the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls. These people were determined to be extremely holy, to, to forge a real covenant with, with Yahweh, um, and never again to have the problems um, that they had experienced in the captivity. But it, things had never gone well. They'd been governed by the, by the, the, the Persians, by the Egyptians, uh, Babylonians. They, they were permanently, and by, later by the Romans, of course, permanently uh, an occupied nation. And they put this down to Yahweh not supporting them because they weren't holy enough. So the only way to get uh, determination, or the kingdom of heaven, as they called it, uh, the rule of Yahweh, was to be better people. And this um, Qumran community, the Essenes, if we call them that, um, started to look at this twin pillar paradigm, paradigm very closely. And it became very real for them, the, this, these two pillars. They identified the, one pillar as Mishpa, and one pillar as Sadek. Mishpa is the power of the king, the control in the country, the making things sensible on earth, and the other is the power of the priest, the power of righteousness. So they believed once they'd got those two pillars in place, there would be an archway uh, with the keystone, which would be shalom. God would rule over them. Now, shalom, of course, is Hebrew for peace, but it, didn't, it isn't, doesn't translate directly. It doesn't mean just peace not being at war. It means all good things, uh, thanks to God. It means your children not dying in childbirth, or, or uh, of disease at some young age. It means the crops not failing, droughts not coming. It means God looking after you generally. So shalom was the state when the kingdom of heaven would arrive. The kingdom of heaven because God would rule over them through his king. So they had to have these twin pillars in place for that to happen. And this turned into the idea of the two messiahs. They were called pillars, the, the references and uh, the New Testament and in the Dead Sea Scrolls to the pillars of the church. Um, they had to get these two pillars in place, these two messiahs. Now, there are other interesting connections. Once we start looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
um, with Freemasonry. Um, Dr. Hugh Schonfield, the um, man who was a um, Nobel uh, Prize nominee and um, a considerable scholar, identified in the Dead Sea Scrolls a cipher, a code called the Atbat cipher, which he also uh, found to be used by the Knights Templar and by Freemasons. It's present in Masonic ritual, it's present in the Knights Templar, and it's present in the Dead Sea Scrolls and nowhere else. So, very strange that those three should connect. So, we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that these people were prolific writers, they wrote things down, uh, which didn't happen a great deal uh, before then, or at least there isn't the documentation to, to show it. Um, and we know from a document called the Assumption of Moses that they were uh, told to bury their most precious scrolls under the Temple of Jerusalem, as close to the holies, holies as they could get them. So we were starting to get a, a pattern here, um, something uh, that was looking like we had a continuity right back from ancient Egypt uh, through to the Jerusalem church. So back to the evidence of the New Testament uh, in the light of the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the story of Jesus and his brother James and John the Baptist. Now, it tells us in the New Testament that everybody wondered whether John the Baptist was the Messiah. And the reason they wondered that is because indeed he was. He was the priestly Messiah. He was the one pillar that had to be in place. He was the founder and leader um, of the, the movement at the time when things were coming to a head. Everyone believed the end of the world was coming. That didn't mean the end of the world in a spiritual sense. It meant that they believed the Romans, the Kittim, were going to be thrown out and they were going to get self-determination and God, Yahweh, would rule over them. And John the Baptist was the leader of this. And he identified Jesus as the man that was ideal to become the the, the kingly Messiah, and he baptized Jesus. And they were intended to be these two pillars, and things were looking pretty good for them. But the Romans uh, knew that the Jews were, were a difficult people. Uh, they'd used the Jews a lot. They made great mercenaries. Uh, they were always great fighters. Um, and there were Roman legions made up of, uh, of, of uh, Jewish soldiers, which were, who were, had very, very impressive uh, records, but they also knew that when the Jews got niggled, they were bad news. So the Romans had to keep a very close eye on this little corner of their empire. And um, they, of course, uh, beheaded John the Baptist in 32 AD, which left a, a problem. Now, we believe that um, Jesus was in the wilderness uh, for three years. It tells us in the Bible, um, 40 days, 40 nights, but there's no explanation for three years. He stayed away for three years. We know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that the wilderness was a term for Qumran. That's what they called it. So we believe that Jesus and his brother James were both there undergoing um, their training, if you like, for three years for the three degrees that they had to move through, just as modern Freemasons do, with the final degree being a resurrection ceremony uh, to make them um, a full member of the inner sanctum of the elite which would equate to being a master mason in Freemasonry today. So between 27 and 31, that's what Jesus was doing, and that is why there's no record of anything happening. When John the Baptist was killed, Jesus did something quite uh, remarkable, we believe. He must have been a one hell of a guy, because he said, I'm going to be both pillars. Um, I should, no, that's not a good way of putting it, was it really? Um, <laughs> He was going to be both pillars, and his brother James said, no, you can't do that. I'm going to be the priestly pillar. You stay as the kingly pillar. Now, James was very much like John the Baptist. He spent all day on his knees, and calluses all over his knees from praying, uh, wa washing permanently, praying permanently. I mean, he really was a holy man. I mean, he's James the just, or, or, or the teacher of righteousness, uh, the leader of the Qumran community. He really was extremely well qualified to become the priestly pillar. But Jesus thought, no, I can get this job done much better if it's just me being the one Messiah. Um, and he was nearly right. But Jesus wasn't a, 
uh, a fluffy, lovey-dovey, softy at all. I mean, you only need to look at the, to read the New Testament um, with some degree of ob objectivity to realize that. I mean, the first thing he did was to get a, a gang of minders behind him, some toughies uh, that would sort things out. Um, he got James and John, the sons of thunder. You can imagine what they look like. He got Simon the Zealot and S Simon the Terrorist and Judas the Knife Man. I mean, <laughs> do these sound like cuddly people? No, they were preparing for war. They were preparing to throw the Romans out. They knew they could do it. They knew God would be behind them if they were holy enough. But Jesus had this inspirational thought. He must have been just fantastic because he had this little sensible idea that Yahweh wouldn't rule over them if some people weren't being holy. It's all right, these little bunch of holy men washing and mumbling around on their knees all day, but what about the rest of the people? The, the, the women and the married men and scum like that, you know, <laughs> the lowest of the low. They were ignored by these holy men and Jesus said, we can't ignore them. They, unless they're holy too, we've had it. You know, we've got to go for this and go for it quickly. And um, he decided that if he was going to win, he needed cash and he needed troops, um, which is pretty sensible. So he went to where the money was. He went to the people that had money, tax collectors. Uh, it says in the Bible, everyone was really upset because he was, he was mixing with these terrible people. But they were the ones with money. Um, it says with drunkards and harlots, but really that was just insults that were thrown at people who spoke to Romans. If a woman spoke to a Roman, uh, she was called a harlot. Um, so it didn't really mean um, uh, literally that they were prostitutes or anything. Um, so Jesus decided to get massive followings behind him because he needed people uh, to, to mobilize and he needed money um, to uh, carry through his idea of throwing the Romans out and creating um, this kingdom of heaven um, in Jerusalem. Some people have said that he was actually trying to unseat Rome and make Jerusalem the center of the world, but that seems extremely unlikely. I think their interest was purely um, the, their homeland, the Holy Land. They didn't really care what happened elsewhere. Now, the first thing he did, the first miracle that Jesus um, did was that he went to a wedding in Cana, and there he turned water into wine which is a great party trick. You can be really popular with that one. <laughs> but really, it doesn't that sound trivial, but we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that um, there was an expression at the time, you can't turn water into wine, which is what they said to Jesus. He said, I'm going to take these people and make them my followers, these women and married men and um, diseased people. Uh, you know, that was unheard of. They were considered to be the water, the common material. You can't turn those commoners into something special. It's a bit like you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And he said, just you watch me. And he went to a, a wedding, which was a, must have been a major wedding at the time. Um, and he turned water into wine in that he took ordinary people and made them his followers. And no doubt he was showing them the rituals, which he wasn't allowed to do. As the Mandians were saying, he was betraying the secrets that were entrusted to him because he was showing these ordinary, unclean people, um, the, these rituals, he was baptizing the lower order of them, and certain of the higher ones, he was actually showing the resurrection ritual. So he was gathering a sub-cult, if you like, together, which sat within the Quran community. And we can see in the New Testament the, the battles that um, resulted uh, between James um, and the family of Jesus. I mean, they, they fell out in, in chunks, um, and Jesus was really quite marginalized. So. Most of the miracles are explainable. Now, the whole idea that Jesus went around raising the dead um, is the error of the Hellenized um, people of the Roman Empire uh, who took as literal truths uh, Jewish terms which were never meant to be taken literally. And of course, he was going around resurrecting people to admit them into the, uh, into the, into the Jerusalem church, into his order, just as Freemasons do today but it's not literal. Um, and it is a fact that the community called the people inside, as all Jewish communities did at the time, they called themselves the living, and everyone outside was the dead. 
And that was just a term. And we know that because um, Jesus said th strange things which make no sense, which are still retained in the Bible. Uh, when he said um, to somebody who asked if he could go home to bury their father who had just died, and he said, no, let the dead bury the dead. Let the dead bury the dead. Well, I mean, what does that mean? But once you understand, he was just saying, leave that to them. We, we've got business here. He told people to, to hate their families. He told them to deny their families, to concentrate on the business that they were conducting. A good example is the story of Ananias and Sapphira, of how that uh, uh, was misunderstood. After the crucifixion, um, everyone was required to, uh, to sell their possessions, to get money together, uh, to mobilize the party um, from a pretty tough situation. And Ananias and Sapphira sold their house, but if you will recall, they kept back some of the money. And uh, they were calling to explain this. Uh, first Ananias came in, and uh, he was struck down dead, it seems. Just no one hit him or did anything. He just dropped down dead. And then his wife, Sapphira, came in, and the same thing happened. When confronted with this guilt, she just dropped down dead and were carried out. Now, either a a mean-minded God uh, stuck out on the finger and killed those two people because they weren't supporting his favorite team quite strongly enough, um, which seems not very godlike to me, um, or they were thrown out of the order. They were sent amongst the dead because they'd cheated. They'd kept some money back, and that was against the rules. So when it says they were dead, it doesn't mean it literally, but they were just thrown out, which is a pretty severe punishment when you believe that the new age was coming and that the kingdom of heaven was going to be there and they weren't going to be part of it. So it wasn't a literal uh, truth. Now, just to turn to the actual character of, uh, or the personage of, of uh, uh, Jesus for a minute, um, there is one uh, surviving description of him. Um, or allegedly a description of the man who must have been enormously charismatic. Um, we can't be certain whether it's true or not, but it, um, Josephus uh, described him in a, a Slavonic text which survived um, the attempts to remove all evidence at the time. And he was described in a wanted poster as <laughs> the Romans did want him. Um, a man of simple appearance, mature age, dark skin, small stature, three cubits high. That's about four foot six inches. Hunched back with a long face, long nose, meeting eyebrows, so that those that see him would be affrightened, with scanty hair and a parting in the middle of his head after the manner of the Nazarites and with an underdeveloped beard. <laughs> now, if this guy was really born in a stable, and not a palace, why does he have to look like a Greek god? All rippling muscles. Why not? You know, um, that is quite likely be tr to be true. And there, there are a couple of um, parts in the New Testament which do seem to indicate that he was an extraordinarily small man, um, even by the standards of the day. So, but there's no reason why not. Um, what, you know, they need to be beautiful um, was quite uh, a foreign um, idea to the, to the Jews. He's known and he's described in the uh, book of Revelations as the bright star of the morning. And his, his whole plan was to fulfill the star prophecy. Um, and he structured everything to, to meet the prophecy originally constructed by Ezekiel, that he would be the prince that would uh, march forth and um, create this kingdom of God on earth. Now he decided to pr prompt um, the Romans into um, action. He went and he kicked the temple around a bit, the moneylenders, then he disappeared off to the east of Bethany and then returned again um, towards and camped in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Romans by this point were pretty fed up. Um, they, the Jews were at it again and they had to do something about it. But whilst they were camped um, on this special morning, his, his timing was perfect. He had to have the, the morning star rising behind him. And what it 
many people probably don't realize is that that Garden of Gethsemane is exactly in front of the two pillars of the temple in Jerusalem, just across the, the hillside. So he was looking at this Roman occupied because of the fortress uh, with the Roman soldiers, Bonatonia, was actually a part of the same temple building. He was that close to the Romans and he was in front of the two pillars. And uh, it's described in the prophecies of how he would swoop in between the pillars and take the place and it would ignite the whole war against the Romans and they would win. His timing was, was perfect. It had to be on this one morning with the star rising behind him, as indeed it was, if you we checked out the, uh, the state of the sky in Jerusalem at that time. But he took this opportunity, just before dawn, to conduct a Masonic, or what we would now call a Masonic ritual. It belonged to them, of course. Then it's been adopted by Freemasonry since. Because it tells us in Mark uh, 14, 51 to 52, and there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young man uh, laid hold on them and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. So as the Romans arrived, there was this young man wrapped in this cloth. Now Freemasons and their resurrection ceremony are wrapped in a shroud. Now that is exactly what we believe what this young man was doing. He was being admitted at uh, the last minute to the higher order for the battle that was about to start. And the Romans came at the exact moment, uh, perhaps rather unexpectedly, to arrest Jesus. Now, coming to the arrest, um, we believe that um, the Romans arrested both pillars, both messiahs. James, the brother of Jesus, who was claiming to be the priestly messiah, at odds with Jesus' claim to be both. Um, so the Romans thought, let's sort this out, we'll arrest them both and Pontius Pilate um, um, decided that he had to remove one, but he didn't need to remove both. If he'd have killed both, there'd have probably been a riot on the spot, and he'd been swinging from the walls before reinforcements uh, could have got there um, to, to help the day. So he decided to do the wise thing and just topple one of those pillars, as they had done before with John the Baptist. Now, the reason that we believe that um, James was also arrested and put on trial is the name Barabbas. Now, you'll recall that uh, Barabbas was arrested on the charge of treason, much the same charge that Jesus was on. And Barabbas quite simply means son of God. Bar, son of, Abba, father, literally son of the father, son of God. The Bible used to record, it was written out, removed a long time ago because it was a little bit inconvenient, but Barabbas, it was called Jesus Barabbas. So Jesus, son of God, walked free. Jesus, king of the Jews, was crucified. So Jesus, son of God, was the priestly pillar. Jesus, king of the Jews, was the, the kingly pillar. They only needed to topple one. And Pontius Pilate knew that I might as well let the most unpopular one go because that's going to cause less problems. So he asked the crowd, which one do you want spared? Which was a very good way because... Uh, the vast majority of people were supporter of, supporters of James. And so they, they called for Barabbas. There's nothing perverse about it. They weren't calling for some uh, criminal to be released. Why would they do that? Um, no, they were calling for James, the teacher of righteousness, to be released. And Jesus, the upstart, uh, to die. Um, this makes a whole lot more sense. And we found a remarkable... A passage in an obscure uh, Jewish uh, text um, which refers, we believe, to this, this occasion very clearly in our view. It says that two priests who were brothers were running, running neck and neck up a ramp and one of them got within four cubits of the altar before the other. So one was leading the other. He took a knife the one used for killing the sacrificial animals and stuck it in his own heart. The patial lamb, the sacrificial lamb. The altar in the temple at Jerusalem, in Herod's temple, had a long ramp going up to it. So it was a description of the, of the race for these two brothers to achieve their goal. One saying he's joint messiah and one to say he's the lone messiah. And then it says afterwards that Rabbi Sadek, that is the teacher of righteousness, came and stood on the steps of the portico of the Temple of the Mount and said, 
Hear me out, O brothers of ours, house of Israel. Lo, it, it says, when a corpse is found, and a body is found, and your elders and judges go forth and measure, now are, as it were to us, whither and whence shall we measure? To the sanctuary or to the courtyard? And the people groaned and wept after what he had said. Now that, that ramp only existed for a small number of years at that time, uh, because it was a new temple, of course. That was a reference by the teacher of righteous, by James the Just, to the book of Deuteronomy, where it explains the rules for identifying the responsibility for a killing, uh, where the a body was found in the open, they would measure to the nearest uh, town, whichever was the nearest town, they would get the elders out and require them to slay an ox that had never pulled a, a yoke and dip their hands in the blood and wash it their hands in blood over and saying, I know nothing of this murder. We are innocent of this murder. And so he's saying, where should we measure? To the sanctuary or to the courtyard? The people he was addressing were in the courtyard. The sanctuary is where the Sanhedrin were. He's saying, should we blame them or do I blame you for taking part in this decision? And they wept when they realized that uh, their teacher of righteousness was blaming them for the crucifixion of Jesus because it was his brother and most important of all, he was one of them and they should not have sided uh, with anyone uh, for the Romans sake now it's under that sacrificial pit that the, uh, this ramp that an important document called the copper scroll was placed which I'll come back to um, and it was concealed beneath a marble block with a, a brass hoop and in every Masonic lodge there is a suspended marble block with a brass hoop now, after the crucifixion, um, James saw the wisdom of his brother's ways. He saw that it was the only way that it was going to work to bring everyone together. And he started adopting the same uh, approach. He became the first bishop of Jerusalem, the Mabaka, um, as it, he was called. And he took to wearing a mitre, exactly as a bishop's mitre would be today. And uh, the reason for that is that if we look at um, an Egyptian um, hieroglyph uh, for the, the god Amun-Ra, uh, the creator god of Thebes, we see he looks exactly like uh, a bishop with a mitre, with a crucifix, which is actually an ank, um, in his hand, and the flowing robes. That was an Egyptian hieroglyph. So once again, showing that there was a, a strong connection with the theology of Jerusalem, to the theology used in Thebes um, and nowhere else, which has never been focused on before. And our work has created a lot of interest amongst biblical scholars uh, to study that connection a lot, uh, a lot more closely. Now, James became the undisputed leader of the Jerusalem church after that point, and that is accepted by just about all uh, biblical scholars now. Not Peter, uh, but James. But then, a character uh, arrived on the scene um, called Saul. Um, now, Saul was his original name, and we're told that he changed it to Paul after he had this conversion on the road to Damascus. Well, that's not the case. He changed his name from the Hebrew name Saul as a very young man to the Roman name Paul when he became a Roman citizen. Paul is a Roman name, and he wanted a name that sounded like his original Hebrew name. So in actual fact, it was the, the reverse, that he changed his name to become a Roman um, and to spend his time persecuting the Jews, uh, the Jewish church. Um, now, many people have... Um, um, Professor Eisenman in California, for, uh, as a leading uh, light in the subject, have identified um, Paul as the spouter of lies referred to in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the person that did a uh, great battle with James. And Paul um, certainly um, admitted that he's a liar um, because he says um, in the New Testament, I, I made myself a Jew to, to the Jews to win the Jews. To those who have no law, I was free of the law myself. I made myself all things to all men. That is how I run, intent on winning. That is how I fight, not beating the air. So he admits, I'll say anything to get my own way. Um, 
So that, that's pretty close to admitting that he is a spouter of lies. Now, he had a great conflict uh, with James. At one point, um, um, Paul had to be rescued from a, a riot where he was about to be lynched by, by Romans um, after a conflict with James. In the Turkish city of Ephesus, he was imprisoned uh, for his own safety, um, for the things that he was saying. Because he claimed to have um, a divine revelation straight from God to him that told him that uh, Jesus Christ, the brother of James, was a God. And James said, what? My brother wasn't a God. Um, so he didn't come from anywhere other than his own mind. Paul invented the idea that Jesus was a God. Last Saturday, um, I was talking to a Roman Catholic priest colleague um, who is also a scholar, and he said, it's just ridiculous. Obviously, Paul completely invented the whole thing, and the church has got off to a bad start from, from the beginning, because it just could not have been that way. Now, James was a very popular man, the teacher of righteousness, <clears throat> and um, the crucifixion took place um, somewhere in the, the, the mid-30s uh, AD, and Paul, uh, sorry, uh, James was killed in 62 AD. He too was killed. Um, he was thrown supposedly from the temple walls um, and hit uh, with a fuller's club, which caused him injuries which just happened to be identical to those of Second Henry Tao. So we imagine, actually, that that is not literally the case. It's probably a pesha, as the Hebrews called it, to identify the two occasions, to identify James with the, the, the legend of Second Henry Tao. But he was killed, and that caused uh, the beginnings of the war that was to break out uh, in 66 AD uh, between the Romans um, and the, the Jews. Now, it, um, an early church father wrote, um, rather con he was rather confused because it was often said that it, the war started because of James, and he wrote, <clears throat> although, in, re in regard to jo Josephus, although not believing in Jesus as the Christ, Josephus, when researching for the true cause of the fall of Jerusalem, ought to have said that the persecution of, Je of Jesus was the cause of the ruin because the people had killed the prophesied Messiah. Yet as if against his will and not far from the truth, he says that this befell the Jews in revenge for Jacob the Just, James the Just, who was the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, because they killed him, although he was a perfectly just man. So the early church fathers couldn't quite work this out, that everyone was, Josephus said that the war started because of the killing of James, and they thought, no, it must have been Jesus. They must have got that wrong. But he didn't get it wrong. Um, James adopted the teachings of his brother about equality, democracy, if you like. Everyone had to be part of the whole, which were quite revolutionary ideas. <clears throat> now, the war broke out in 66 AD, and it was a terrible war. It, there were Jews killing Jews, uh, Romans killing Jews, and people dying all over the place. And it went quite well at first, and they defended Jerusalem quite successfully. But it was a war they were never going to win. Uh, the might of the Roman Empire was always going to defeat this small country. But of course, they believed that Yahweh would, would come fire-breathing and just blast away uh, the enemy. They were a, a passionate, inspired people uh, rather than a mechanistic and, and logical people, as the, uh, as the Romans may well be described. But um, in 68 AD, um, Qunram was destroyed, uh, the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. But those scrolls found in Qumran that are so important really are just the, the shopping lists and the, the tittle-tattle. The really important documents had to be buried beneath the Temple of Jerusalem, as close to the Holy of Holies as it is possible. And the copper scroll that was found at Qumran, so-called, because it's made of copper, um, is like a, a treasure list. It says where things are buried um, all over the place. And it identifies that in the sacrificial pit, the blood collecting pit beneath the altar in Jerusalem is a copy of this same scroll which contains even more information. 
and it identifies that there are in total 24 scrolls buried beneath the temple in Jerusalem that belong to that community, their most important scrolls, along with a huge amount of treasure, coins, gold and silver objects, um, vessels used in the, in the holy rituals in the temple. Um, a vast, vast amount of uh, wealth was buried there. Uh, because they were looting the whole of the countryside, they were taking things from the Romans as well as their own possessions, and they buried everything there. Because they knew if everything else fell, the temple would not, because Yahweh would never allow that to happen. Unfortunately, uh, Yahweh did allow that to happen. Um, <laughs> because in 70 AD, Titus... Um, destroyed the city. He tried not to, he wanted to preserve it, um, so it is said, um, but it was utterly destroyed because they, they fought desperately to the end, but the Holy Holies itself was destroyed. Um, many of the defending Jews went underground into the, uh, the tunnels and caverns um, to re-emerge uh, to fight uh, again if they could. But in that war that happened between 66 and uh, the last remnants probably around uh, 74, 75 AD. Um, virtually the entire population of the Holy Land was destroyed, were killed, men, women and children. According to Josephus, 1.3 million people. That's an awful lot of people in those days. Now it's rather interesting that the New Testament, which is obviously fixated by um, the arrival of its new Messiah and his people, doesn't even notice that all of them were killed the writings uh, cease in about 66 AD, the writings of um, um, Paul, and the earliest dating for Mark, the first of the, the Gospels, is around 75. So they stopped during that period of the, of the war, and no one noticed that everyone was killed. <laughs> <clears throat> now, the problem was that the people then who had to write down the history um, of Jesus uh, and the goings-on in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus the Christ had no first-hand knowledge. In fact, they had no second-hand knowledge. They had, at best, third-hand knowledge. And they were people from um, uh, the empire rather than uh, Jerusalem Jews that understood the real mindset. Because at that time, the only place a Jew could worship was at the temple. You know, the idea of synagogues was just sort of starting in the empire, but uh, they were not places of worship. They were places of gathering together. So they had bags of opportunity to misunderstand uh, the terms resurrection and turning water into wine. They had a sort of a Hellenistic um, outlook, um, which is quite different. And they converted into their sort of um, uh, mystery cults that um, uh, were so popular in, in Rome at the time. And there was a, a complete loss of the original truths. Now, we believe that the, the rituals that they used, that the history of the of the Jerusalem church were recorded in documents that were buried under the temple and they were placed there. So it's known by scholars that um, Matthew, Mark and Luke based their gospels on a previous document, a previous gospel, which is known just as simply as Q. That gospel of Q is or was under the temple of, of Herod. So we start to have a, a good grip on um, what was buried there. There's hard documentary evidence when and why and how documents were buried there. We know that the British Royal Engineers went there in uh, the last century, didn't find any documents or treasures. All they found were remnants of the Knights Templar. So the conclusion seems to be inescapably that the Knights Templar removed what was there. Now, the Knights Templar, we couldn't work out why they had um, gone excavating beneath the temple. Maybe they were just looking for treasure. Maybe they were looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Who knows? They thought it was Solomon's temple. They didn't realize it was Herod's temple, some people say. Um, but shortly after they were founded, the rumors were going around that they were conducting strange rituals, that they were heretical that they denied Christ, all sorts of rumors were going around. And as I mentioned earlier, they survived from their official founding in 1128 through to uh, uh, 1307, when they were finally 
destroyed as heretics. Um, whatever it was they found, they would have to keep secret uh, because there wouldn't be time to explain before they were burnt at the stake. Um, the, the church did not welcome uh, new information. They'd gone to great lengths to make sure that information wasn't available. The library at Alexandria was burnt to the ground. Um, any uh, heretical documents, i.e. anything that wasn't officially recognized, were destroyed. Heretics were destroyed. Um, they had things under control. So these nine founding knights knew that they had to keep them very quiet. And their first uh, preceptory that they built outside of the Holy Land uh, was built um, in Scotland, just south of Edinburgh, um, which is extremely significant, um, and I'll come back on to shortly. Now, when they were arrested, they were arrested by Philip IV, Philip the Fair of France. The Holy Land had been lost by the beginning of the 1300s. Um, their glorious past was a, a, a memory, and uh, the Pope was allegedly uh, trying to amalgamate the order of the hospitalers with the, with the Templars and have a single uh, outfit. And uh, Jacques de Molay, the last Grand Master, was summoned to come uh, to Paris. The fact is that Philip IV uh, of France was bankrupt and he needed money desperately. Um, and he knew that the Templars were phenomenally rich and he wanted their treasury. He'd had huge loans from, in, from them in the past. And he conspired well, in 1306, the year before, he'd conspired to rob every Jew in France. He just suddenly uh, announced that uh, all Jewish possessions should be seized and they should be uh, uh, exiled, which is a very convenient way of getting large amounts of money. And fortunately, that's been done uh, to the Jews uh, a number of times uh, before. But that still wasn't enough money, so he decided to, to grab the Templar money. And he had evidence of their uh, rituals um, and their beliefs. So it was going to be relatively easy for him to justify uh, seizing it. And on uh, that day, on Friday the 13th of October 1307, they moved against the Templars and arrested them en masse all across France. In the Paris Temple, uh, Jacques de Molay, was seized. Now the Templar fleet had been brought into La Rochelle Harbour. But sometime on that Thursday night before the Friday morning, they slipped away, they disappeared. The secrecy had been kept pretty well uh, by the French, but they'd missed a trick. Somebody had heard something and they just were no longer there. The whole fleet was just gone. And it was never seen again. Although their battle flag was seen again, a battle flag was a skull and crossbones. Just as in a Masonic Lodge, the skull and crossbones are on the floor. And we believe they sailed, well, part of the fleet sailed to Scotland and part of the fleet sailed to Portugal, just a little way down, because Portugal was very sympathetic to them, um, as was Scotland. Um, and they restocked and they sailed exactly due west in search of a star called Marica. In a French order, it was called La Marica. And they found the land across the sea, the ocean to the west, and they landed there at least in the early weeks of 1308. Maybe they'd been there before as well. And they called the land America, uh, where everything was wonderful. Um, and they settled there. There is evidence. There is a, the Newport Tower in Rhode Island, which is identifiable as a, a medieval Templar uh, round building. Um, and there is uh, what is known as the Westford Knight, a carving, a tombstone believed to be of a knight by the name of Gunn, uh, who was buried at the time. So there is evidence of Templar uh, existence uh, in, in what is now the United States of America. There is also evidence um, in Scotland that the Templars were trading with America before Columbus. And that is the building of Roslyn Chapel, which I'll come on to in a moment, which has carved into it the lower cactus. It has uh, maize, uh, American corn carved into it, and numerous other plants, which are New World plants. And that building was 
uh, built between 1440 and completed in 1490. So in the middle 1400s, uh, they were carving in plants which are uniquely from this continent. Um, and of course, good old Columbus didn't land until 1492. And then that was uh, not the mainland at all. Um, so there is a problem with the idea of Columbus discovering America. And we, c considering that there is cocaine in the mummies found in uh, ancient Egypt, um, there's a lot of problems with the idea of Columbus. Since writing the, our first book, we've been contacted by lots of people who've got information for us. Uh, a multi, multi-millionaire um, Norwegian shipping magnate um, uh, informed in many things, but, but he also said that there are records in the city of Bristol that have got the logs of ships that sailed trading with um, North America before Columbus sailed. Still, the documents are still there. Um, the, there was a bishopric that the, 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 the church in Rome actually had a bishop with responsibility for uh, Newfoundland. So there is a huge amount of problem with it. Now, it, we believe that it's called America because it was La America named after the star, the Venus setting in the West. The conventional idea, of course, it was uh, that it was uh, Amerigo Vespucci, um, that it was named after him. Um, but that's a well-known error because it, that was a monk called Valsi Muller who was fascinated by words and numbers and names and he loved playing with them. And he had, unfortunately, one of the first printing presses in the world. And he worked out that America must be called that because Amerigo Vespucci, um, who didn't, it was very insignificant, very late, um, and didn't sail very much anyway. Um, <laughs> and he got it wrong, and he, but he printed it. And the power of the printed word did its worst for the first time in history. He soon was told, hey, you've got that wrong. And he thought, oh my God, what shall I do? And he tried to retrieve everything, but he couldn't. He tried to retract, but he couldn't. So the idea that um, America is called after America Vespucci is just not true. So, the knights that went to, to Scotland, <clears throat> they went there for one very good reason, and that is that Robert the Bruce was king of the Scots at the time, and he was excommunicated. So there was no power uh, for, of the Pope to get at them in Scotland. That was one reason. The other reason was that their, their principal estates um, were in Scotland. They were fundamentally what we call a French order, but they, they made their really important um, um, estates in Scotland. They, they built all across Europe. All the great medieval cathedrals were built by the Templars. Um, they were building the New Jerusalem everywhere across, uh, across Europe. But we had um, read about uh, this Roslyn Chapel in Scotland, as it's called, built in, uh, begun in 1440, that had these plants carved into it. And so Robert and I drove up there to have a look at it. But when we got there, uh, we realized that there was much, much more significance than just that. 